the pregame engineer tailgate mayor racing podcast episode number 23 for friday october 30th 2015 i am tailgate mayor rusty wallace joined as always by pregame engineer andrew sherwin what's up man hey uh this is kind of a normal location for you to do the podcast from but but not for me a couple big guys in a small little room so hopefully there's not too much echo yeah, that's right. We're in the famous craft room where I usually sit and where my wife does all her sewing and everything. We don't have uh, Serena here as our producer today. She's downstairs getting ready for the party of the year yeah, every she's year. A, she's a busy bee. She's prepping for BYOP party that we do here at the house. It's the one that we actually invite everybody to, including kids and stuff. So you got to right. put bumpers on all the corners and forks and all the outlets and everything else for I sure guess you cannot forks. walk with your eyes at a normal adult level or you will knee a toddler in the face <laughs> right <laughs> so uh yeah everybody brings their own pumpkin we got beer we're cooking out we do the whole deal so that's going to kick off here in a little bit and why we're doing this on an afternoon instead of on a normal evening when we're a little bit uh, a few more beers deep i would say yeah it would be a little tough to do this in the middle of the party i think one or two things would happen people would be disappointed that one of the hosts is not participating in the party or we'd have 15 people wanting to be on this thing what you got there drinking uh local double ipa uh from monday night brewing uh called the blind pirate it's uh it's amazing really it's really tasty i like their style it's a monday night brewery monday night brewing and they they always have a businessman on the front that's always doing something different so the blind pirate has this businessman with uh eye patch around him and uh I don't know, a headband thing to make him look like a pirate, but he's still got his suit and tie on. So right, it's right. Kinda cool. Well, the uh, the original, uh, their first IPA, the eye patch, is just this guy with the eye patch. Yeah. But to make him blind, they sure enough put a blindfold <laughs> on him and covered the other eyeball up. That's Everything. Functional. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. So, actually, you brought what are you this got? beer over because <laughs> all my beer is still getting cold. Uh, the Another local, Jekyll Brewing Company, the Hot Dang Diggity. Southern India Pale Ale, as they call it. Yeah, in case y'all hadn't sorted out the theme here, is if we're drinking liquor, we're drinking bourbon. And if we're <laughs> drinking beer, we're usually drinking something local, and it's an ale style. Yeah, something chewy. Yeah. <laughs> Especially. And by chewy, we mean lots of hops and lots of flavor. So I mentioned the BYOP party before. This is October 30th, man. This is our Halloween party episode. So I didn't get dressed up for this. Heck one. Maybe yeah! I'm a no, I, I'm a save my Georgia Tech fan. Save my costume for tomorrow. I think. Yeah, you've well, already seen it, but maybe we'll, we'll, we'll let the cat out of the bag. Maybe we'll take a group photo and send it out with the podcast handle tomorrow night. Yeah, sounds good. So we do have a new shout out for today. So let's bring it up. <laughs> there it is. So That's tell us right. about this shout out. This is kind of funny. Okay, yeah, we'll just. I'll start with the backstory. Um, so this this anonymous uh, Twitter handle uh, with a very particular name started following me, the podcast, and Rusty all at the same time. And we have an email list, so we kind of goof around on it during the day when we have time, post links and stuff, and make fun of each other. Typical guy stuff. Yep. And, and Rusty totally accused me of creating <laughs> this handle because the name is so unique. We were pretty sure we had to be the ones that coined the term. Yeah, there's um, no way. So when when Joey Logano was struggling through his tenure at Joe Gibbs, uh, particularly I think maybe the first or second year we coined yeah, this term, couple. we started calling him Joey Last Place. Yeah. And uh, as we are apt to do, create nicknames that some of them we can share on the podcast, some we cannot. <laughs> And and we just it just makes it more fun for us, especially when it's somebody we couldn't we don't really care about either way. It's just kind of fun to make fun of somebody that's struggling or whatever you want to you know maybe that's not right, but it's still entertaining. So anyway, Joey Last Place is now a Twitter handle, and uh, we want to give a shout out to them. I'm assuming they heard about the name because they somehow got in touch with the podcast. Yeah, and they well they listened to the cool. po- We've talked about that before. We used to call him Joey Last Place. We've said it before on the right. podcast. We've definitely so. said it on the podcast. I don't want to take credit away from you if you were creative enough to, to make that name up on your own and totally didn't know about it. Um, but anyway, we're glad to have you. We all hope you download the episode if you're not watching on live Periscope. Uh, once again, we are doing live amateur radio and television, Yeah, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, so, I, yeah. I definitely accuse Sherwin of creating that profile. Like, uh-oh, Sherwin's up to something because... 
I got followed by Joey last place. <laughs> well, and I was so innocently innocent that when he showed the screen caption of being followed by him, I was like, oh, did you log on to the podcast handle? Because he just followed the podcast, and he's like, yeah. no, this is you, dude. I'm like, no, no, it's not. <laughs> we had a good, uh, you know, over email, you can be a lot more acidic than you would oh, be in yeah. person. It so gets we're pretty just, rotten on the email. <laughs> we're calling each other names and, and calling BS on each other and everything else. So uh, that was fun. <laughs> So that gets us. I, I want to spend this episode talking about Talladega because those we're going to do probably twenty to twenty five minutes on Talladega. Y'all. Oh, easy, easy, right here. It and may be the whole show. There's a lot to talk about, and I think the best way to talk about it is to go start to finish, so we don't bury the lead on everything else and get ourselves mixed up in some grandpa yeah, story. Yeah, you'll be a little bit better at the chronological stuff than me, so I'll take cues from you. Well, I wrote it down. Good. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, look at me, the journalist. Hey, we notes. have a show sheet. We have our notes, but now we have an official show sheet. Right. We may have to work a commercial in there. Well, I think we already did. Monday night and Jekyll definitely just got a free commercial. For sure. So, I'll start with... An interesting omen posted by Mr. Matt Weaver, who's a, a follower of the podcast and a sometimes listener. So if you're listening, uh, shout out. But he posted before the race, uh, and I think it was like on Friday or something, he posted that Talladega always has, this isn't the exact words, but Talladega always has optimism leading into it, followed by a crushing, why do we do this afterwards? Yeah, I thought... I. It's one of those things you read and you go, wish I could have said it the way he said it because that's exactly the way I feel about it. Exactly. And, I mean, on top of that, he did, he, he sent that on, on maybe it's Thursday, Friday, something, and somebody had called him out after the race and said, oh, look at Matt Weaver with the omen here of the or the prediction. Well, the thing is, I mean, yeah, kinda cool. so give him a golf clap because he's right, but the thing is, it's a guarantee. Mm-hmm. There's always something that happens at Talladega we're like what in the hell are we doing yeah you know it it doesn't always happen at Daytona it always happens at Talladega yeah well you remember I boycotted the spring race do you remember that I mean we we even said it on the podcast I I, I didn't watch I looked at it like through one eye yeah on the small tv or something on the little tv yeah Yeah, it just and it's I hate it that it's this way but because it's an eliminator race elimination race and because it's in the chase. I feel compelled to have to watch it. Uh, well, if watch you're, the, if the you're fall a fan, race. you watch the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I'm watching. I'm watching the World Series, and I don't, I don't care. Right, about I'm watching the World New Series. New York and Kansas City. Um, I don't rightly know who to root for because we've got two former Braves on each squad. <laughs> but that's digression that we need to get back to where we were because Talladega. All right, let's start from the top. <laughs> Well, so well, you started with the top I, I with a Friday saying, comment by uh, you know a yeah, journalist yeah, and that I was we saying, respect I, a lot. I even went a little further back and said I boycotted the spring race. Now I'm compelled to watch this one, right? So we sit down and qualifying. Let's talk about qualifying because that's actually a, a good piece that came up. Four out of the top five qualifiers were the Hendrick team. I thought that yeah. was pretty interesting. Obviously, they got something right uh, with their with their motor tuning and with their aero package or both. One of those, one or the other, or both. So you expect a strong performance anyway at the restrictor plate races for the Hendrick team, but especially after a top four, or all four of them qualified in the top five. Right. Well, since we've been doing the single car qualifying, uh, Hendrick's been very dominant. I mean, we had a couple of those that we did that silly group style at, at a plate track where you've got drafting going on during qualifying. They luckily figured that out. Pretty quick. Yep. And thankfully, we didn't have the big one during qualifying, although some cars got wrecked at Daytona. Um, yeah, where did we go there? I got about lost my mind. That's all talking right. Yeah, talking about qualifying. And, yeah. Uh, and Har- uh, Harvick Hendrick. Hendrick. Uh, doing really well there. So let's move on a little bit and we'll go to Hamlin. Hamlin suffers from a roof hatch that popped up. I didn't know about this thing. I'm going to tell you what. I. Yeah, what was that, like 10 laps in? That <laughs> thing right, was right at the beginning, yeah. And I was like, are you kidding me? Because if y'all recall, huh, that was old Sure Daddy's pick. Yeah, I picked Denny Hamlin. Um, yeah, and I, apparently it's an option. Yeah, you, I heard that. You don't have to run it. They showed the roofs of several other cars that didn't have it. I believe they chose to go with that option 
due to Denny's knee condition that perhaps uh, they might need to pull him out from the top yeah. instead of him trying to get himself out from the using side. A, using a Sherwin, uh, Sherwinism. Fat chance he'll do that again. Fat chance <laughs> he'll do that again, for sure. Because, I mean... Ha- <laughs> Taking a breath? Yeah, so one of the biggest things about these plate races and, and when they change the rules, and I'm not going to talk about the race specifically, but about plate racing is there's nothing you can do in a wind tunnel or in a small test that can give you the kind of disruption of air that you'll get when 40 cars are doing 200 miles an hour in a pack. Yeah. Like the amount of disruption, it's if you've got a weak point on your car, it's it's going to find it. Yeah, it'll Obviously, get exploited. found it on Hamlin's car. Yeah, I thought at first it was one of just one of the roof hatches that you know makes it so that they don't turn upside down when they go back. I did too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the air disruptors that are that are in the roof and, and the cow flaps that are in the front of the car. Yeah, but sure enough, it was a sunroof that then they had to try to tape up. Didn't work out the first time. Had to tape up again, and eventually Hamlin, who's a chase contender, had to rely on other people because you're not going to make it up at Talladega very easily. You're no. Not, yeah. So you're relying on other people at this point to get in, which I think is a is a weird situation. It's weird in a sense that once you do get your car right, you can run the same speed as leaders, but be two or three or however many laps down, and without a significant number of cautions in a row and some that need to happen really close to each other so people don't pit, you're not getting back on the lead lap. Yeah, it's just not happening. Yeah, and we didn't have many cautions until lap one eighty six or whatever. <laughs> just thought of a holy bleep. Go for it, holy bleep. Okay, no, Here, I'll I'm save gonna... it. Put it for later. Okay, put it All for right. later. Well, well, this is what's going to happen with this, y'all. I did a little <laughs> bit of research for the very first one, and then the last two have happened during conversation. I remember the kind of stat that you just go, "What in the heck? How did that even happen?" So we'll have that later, and I'll remember it then. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know how you let that happen to you. Uh, plate race it's so important how you could how, how you could have such a simple part fail and wreck your day yeah well we saw it happen two weeks ago with jimmy johnson three weeks ago with jimmy johnson on what we what we called on the podcast they said a $15 oh yeah 15 dollar gear seal yeah yeah i mean so i mean you got you got to cross fiction. all the t's and dot all the i's is what we're saying the truth is stranger is, than fiction often you don't have to pay i mean you have to pay as much attention to that 15 dollar part as you do the hundred and fifty thousand dollar engine Absolutely, you have to, uh, because every one of them is needed to make the car go. So let's, real quick, since we're talking a little bit about cautions, but on pit stops, let's talk about Junior. Did he have? A, did he just throw a stick in his spokes every pit stop? He was smoking the tires every time he came in. Did he talk about that? Uh, well, I think, I, remember. I think the, um, if I had to guess, and I tried to watch after about the third time to see if he was actually locking the tires up. Yeah. My thought after the second time I saw it because the smoke was so uh, symmetrical out of both sides of the car Mm -hmm. I think maybe they had their front end geometry set up to where when he crammed the brakes and the car really hammers down in the front that the the body was coming down on both tires and so they were still spinning but the smoke's coming from the body rubbing on the tires huh yeah I didn't see any follow up on that or what was going on because I tried to watch the NASCAR on the tire you know yeah yeah is it is it stopped because like when jamie mcmurray does it he's oh, yeah. bald spot in the tires <laughs> yeah, not to yeah. pick on jamie i just he's the one that comes to mind that a lot of times will lock him up coming to pit road juniors it looked like his were still spinning so if we a good I, point. I mean you can go back the listeners and the viewers go back and take a look um look at some footage but i i, I think they were just running some kind of crazy uh spring and shock setup that allowed the body to come all the way down onto the front tires maybe that's what maybe that's what hendrick figured out and got four guys in the top five qualifying for that perhaps matter. and got these guys fast i mean they were still fast all day yes junior was up front all day so why don't you go with the holy bleep because we've got uh, uh we've got plenty to talk about but we've got um we're, we're about done with with pit stops here, so let me let me or go ahead and play it, it so that we can hear it. Sure. Holy <laughs> shit! <laughs> yeah. So because we were talking about getting laps down at Talladega, we have to go back and remember. And and I'm gonna pick the wrong year. I want to say it was either '86 or '87. I could be wrong. It doesn't really matter. Today you can't make up two laps without help because of the way the drafting works. 
you have to have cautions or you have to have right. there ain't no Ricky Bobby have, there ain't no Ricky <laughs> Bobby right but there was a Bill Elliott true who once got down two laps at Talladega made him up under green <laughs> and won the race that's having how fast how much faster of a car do you have to have I don't know how many laps it took him to do it but I would venture to guess you probably have to be 15 to 20 miles an hour faster than the leader yeah I mean you have to be making up what three seconds lap, and they're running what forty five, fifty second lap. What are they running? In those days, um, you know that year, Bill Elliott qualified at two hundred and twelve. Oh yeah, no set, restrictor. Sorry, set the. <laughs> there's no restrictor plates yet. Um, the cars are such that they get spread apart. Uh, there wasn't this locked together stuff like we have today, where you just can't get away from anybody. Mm-hmm. It was very much like running a race at Atlanta, just bigger, a mile. Point one six longer, point one two longer, mm-hmm. and and so he just had more motor than everybody else by a bunch. That's nuts. I mean, it's a, if that happened today, I mean, he couldn't. But if a similar scenario would happen today, that's where you would see the driver blow the motor up during the burnout because they don't that's going to figure out what they did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, you can't blow up the ninth and tenth cylinders and not be, get away with it. <laughs> right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, I I think. We should fast forward at this point, and this is one of my biggest gripes with Talladega. That I and the reason I boycotted it before, I said this is 180. What is it? 188 laps. 188. 188. Yeah. I say it's 186 laps of going around in circles. If you're not a NASCAR fan, and you make fun of NASCAR by saying, "Oh, they just go round and round in circles." If you watch the first 179 laps of that race, NASCAR is exactly a bunch of rednecks driving in circles. Yeah. Yeah. Which that's all it was. Complaint. Yeah, that's our complaint, or my complaint for a long time. So let's just go ahead and fast forward. A bunch. <laughs> Heavy glare now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, well. What's a <laughs> uh, maybe I can pull the uh, pull the blinds down and get lucky here. Hey, there's a spot. All right. All right, cool. Now our, now our, uh, if we go long enough, it'll up. continue to be a problem because yeah, the sun will get lower and lower. True. So, um, so I want to fast forward this race to, I don't know, lap 179 or so. Sounds good to me because nothing else. There's happened. nothing to say about all those laps that happened in between, right. except for that Junior overcame a whole bunch of crappy pit stops, and Denny Hamlin Hamlin's roof broke the roof flap. That's it. I, did I, Algar blow a motor somewhere in there? I don't I think, know. Yeah, it doesn't really matter though. I might have been taking a nap. Yeah, there's, I could have. I could have been watching football. Did we uh, just to go all ADD? Did we finish out the holy bleep? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I said it really fast, Bill okay. Elliott. Made up two laps that's it. under green and that's won it. the race at Talladega. Holy bleep. Yeah, that's Got a it. holy bleep moment. Got it. Okay, so you <laughs> you sent something to me, and I was laughing my butt off, and I said, we got to say that on the podcast. And it was right when Jamie McMurray, of all people, what, uh, who you were just talking about, um, he blew up with, well, I mean, there was like four or five, maybe six laps ago, something like that. Sounds about right. Yeah. So he set up the yeah well, he, he blew to, up and Sherwin texts me LOL exclamation NASCAR hit the detonator button on the one to prevent fuel mileage win <laughs> that's right because uh, uh, Biffle was in the lead yeah by half by a lap half a lap yeah. and just yeah, just putting around putting riding around behind a riding behind a lapper yeah riding behind a lapper so trying to win and everybody's talking about what's going on behind him because there's all kinds of drama going on there and. Uh, yeah, he's just going yeah. around the track. And uh, another four or five laps, uh, he probably had the gas to do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Especially riding behind lap cars and yeah. just getting a tow. Yeah. And especially being a half a lap ahead, he could have did the opposite of what Bill Elliott did in 87 or whenever. <laughs> right. He was probably running third or a quarter throttle. Yeah. Yeah. So I laughed my butt off when he said that NASCAR, <laughs> I'm imagining some dude up there and somebody going... Uh, we can't have this. And some guy's There's got 43 a, buttons. Yeah, he's got red buttons, 43 of them. All right, hit the one. Are you sure it's the one? Yes, the one. Hit the one. And well, there goes they his open engine. themselves to this kind of conspiracy <laughs> theory thought or humor for us. It's not a real thought, it's humor. But they open themselves up to that because it seems so convenient. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, wait, a Hendrick powered car just ran. Four hundred and Just ran four hundred and ninety miles, miles whatever, and now yeah. they're gonna blow up. Yeah, really? Yeah. <laughs> and neither one of those Ganassi cars are in the chase, so it's not like they're playing too many games. It's not like 
you know, uh, Kyle's in the chase and and uh, Jamie's not, and so they're you know one guy's trying something. What are you trying to tell Dave? I mean, Dave, the whole car is going to be completely different when we get to Daytona. Yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Now, was that the one that led to the first green-white checker, or was that when Dale... I think that's when Dale smoked the tires again coming in and went out 10th or so, or whatever. Yeah, that, that was the one. That sounds about right. Yeah, and he came back out 10th because everybody else just wanted fuel. He had to change tires. He had to tires. change tires, yep. So he came out. I say 10th. It might have been 12th, 15th, whatever it was. He come out, and they ran a few laps, and I don't even remember what the next caution was, unless it was that and we're just messing up in our heads. I don't care. Uh I don't think it. No, it couldn't have been that. Cause, no, the next uh, caution was. I mean, and I don't know when we're going to get to, like the whole main thing we're going to talk about the end, <laughs> the last four or five laps. But yeah, it was, there was the caution for the blown up motor, and then we're going to line them up and do a green white checker. Okay, so it did go to green white checker at that point. No, it couldn't have because Dale Jr. still had to make up all those spots. So at some point, <laughs> at some point there was oh. a caution. At some point there's a caution. Junior makes up another six or eight lap, uh, or there's there's six or eight laps that we run. Junior Junior makes deal up must have happened before. Yeah, yeah. Junior makes up eight or ten positions, and he's he's fixing to run up front, and but we still have the sixteen out front technically. Yes. Uh, due to fuel mileage, yes. so the one blows up, and now it's green white checker time, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So leading the field back around. P.S. Rusty picked Dale Jr., and as mad as I was in cussing uh, last week when your guy took out my guy, <laughs> here I am sitting pretty with Mr. Talladega himself. Yeah, no kidding. Running up next to Joey last place, <laughs> uh, who doesn't need a win. He's the only guy who doesn't need the win, by the way. <laughs> That's right, because he won the first two and, and therefore took away the, uh, the free pass to the next round. Right. So... They line up, and something happens. And so this, I've been thinking about this for a while, and I'm glad that we didn't do this podcast Sunday night, because it had been a little different, my thoughts. When I woke up the next morning I thought about it, I was like, okay, there's a few more things that I'm okay with, but it's strange. First off, here's what happened. They come to the, they're coming to the line, they get the green flag, essentially, or they get the green light or whatever. Yeah. They're in the start start zone that we've been railing on on the podcast for a while. Oh, yeah. They're in that zone, so they're starting. They're moving. Gas, or foot on the gas pedal. Go. And something happens. I don't remember what happened in the back on, on the first attempt. But uh, there's a caution that comes out before they even hit the start-finish line. And before the flag man can even pull the green flag out, he's throwing the yellow. So NASCAR, and this is a green white checkered, and by the way, we didn't back up. Yeah, we do need to back up. We do need to back we up. That's one important component. The important component is last week NASCAR said we're only going to do one attempt at a green white checkered at Talladega uh, for safety reasons or whatever, uh, plus a big crash that we had in Daytona. Uh, what's his butt? Um, Austin Dillon. Austin Dillon. Did a barrel roll. Yeah. And so into the fence. Into the fence. And they... So they said, for safety reasons, we're only going to do one green-white checkered attempt. Drivers were okay with it. I thought it was a little weird, and, and other media guys... I shouldn't say that like I'm putting myself with other media people, but uh, I, I agreed with a, a lot of the other media guys, which is, you know, this only happened once in the last 15 tries at Talladega. It's not like this is a... If you're trying to improve safety, this isn't step one for improving safety. You know what I mean? This isn't the big taking the big bite here. Well, the step to improve safety, if you think green white checkers are unsafe, then you don't have them at all. Or or something or or you improve the arrow to where we're not doing this. Well, that's my that's my beef and I don't know if we're going to get into opinions on are we going to do that too? Maybe later. Yeah, we'll do everything. About what we think you could do to the car to make make it so they don't run on a big pack like that. Well, go ahead and tell us. We'll we'll get back to what happened right here on the first? Yeah, time. well, I think I think that there's two things you can do. Number one, make those cars unstable, packed up underneath another car, uh, and two, take some motor away from them. They got plenty of motor. Yeah. So there's been some complaints about taking away the. I mean, we took away motor this year, right? Uh, did we? Went from oh, did they close horsepower they, down? Uh, yeah, they did. You're right. 
they went down 150 horsepower. Yeah. But when you put the restrictor plate on, how much is like how much does that make? A how much is that yeah, residual yeah. effect is there? Yeah. Good point. So I I agree with you. I think it's the arrow. Now the problem is if you make them squirrely behind somebody, how many more wrecks are you going to have now? <laughs> yeah. Or are they going to get away? I, I'd I'd like to see them take a big swing and it go and go whoops than to just keep inching along and we still have the same thing. Like, we still have the same thing. Inch, 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 and it still looks the same. It's looked exactly the same for 10 years. Minus... At Talladega. Yeah, minus the tandem that was awesome. The tandem was awesome. Even, like, so many people hated it, and and I don't don't know any of those people that hated it. I I know a a couple um, that somehow forget that in the days of Earnhardt um, isn't what we have today. We, I, did we talk about it last week, the Earnhardt thing? I think we did. Yeah. But I'll bring it back up. The reason why he was able to make all those passes in 2000 is because those cars weren't right up underneath each other's rears. Mm-hmm. They were 12 to 20 feet apart. Yeah. So go back to that or or bring so, back tandem. <laughs> that was the most fun racing I've I had. Saw, in... I saw Brett Griffin, who is, uh, is Clint Boyer's spotter in Cup, and he's uh, Elliot Sadler's business manager and spotter in the Xfinity series and he's like I think Clint said it Clint uh, tweeted at Jeff Burton he said man we were good at that thing and he showed a picture of the one he won with Jeff uh-huh. Burton's help and uh, Jeff replied and Brett said man I wish we'd go back to that that's the most fun I've ever had as a spotter oh no or kidding something like no that. kidding they're up there wheeling dealing t- checking with all the other spotters we've talked about this all the time but the, the guys talking to each other on the radios, yeah. I the, mean, it got excessive when you in. had all forty other drivers in your car. But let me tell you <laughs> something. Right. More first, data, more the data. The first time that, that I heard our driver key in and talk to somebody else, I was like, "Man, that's cool. <laughs> that is cool. That is really cool. That is cool." And uh, you want drama? That's the best drama I've seen. I, I was glued to and my. And we television didn't have very many big wrecks either for a hundred and eighty-eight laps, all of them. I wanted to know what's going on. Who's going to hang out with who? Who's going to... And here's your drama. Who's going to leave somebody else out in the dust, and then they're not going to help them later on? Right. You know? Right. So there's your drama parts, if you need drama in this whole thing. So I I don't know. I don't know. I think there was a ton of people that were upset that Trevor Bain won one of them. Um... I'm not and, well, not just people. one, a Daytona 500. Well, the Daytona the 500. premier right. event in NASCAR. I'm not uh, one of them that's upset because I thought the racing was so much more fun to watch than what we had before. I was like, eh, I mean, maybe if it's the only race the kid ever wins, that's pretty cool. There's been other people who the only race they ever won was the Daytona 500. I can't name them, but it's happened. Um, and there's a ton of guys that only won one race at Talladega. Mm-hmm. You know? And that's the nature. Of the, I think that's why in the, uh, the roots of the sport, people... They need Talladega and Daytona because the puncher, you know, there's a puncher's chance. Mm-hmm. Everybody's got a puncher's chance at those yeah. racetracks, and there aren't any other ones. Take that so swing and hook, and I can see what suffer happens. through four plate races a year, uh, but I think they can do better than what we got. Absolutely, absolutely, the product that's out there, we can do better. So let's bring it back around. Then let's bring it back. To We're this. about to do a green white checker. We're about to do a green white checkered. Something happens. They don't get to the start finish line before the caution comes out. NASCAR decides to do what they are want to do, oh, yeah. no uh, which is that's W O N T folks. W O N T want won't, uh, to want do. to do, which is make up a rule in the middle of a race and see what. Happens. I mean, make one up. <laughs> Just make it up. These guys, we've been talking about the start finish zone for weeks. For a couple months now, actually, because yeah. all the horse hockey that's been going on, Brad Keselowski and everybody else is, uh, uh, and Jimmy Johnson, who star are they starting? Are they not right. going? Who's cramming in in the back of the last guy? Uh, sure. So I don't know. I lost my train of thought because I got all excited. Yeah, the point I, is, that's what happens. We're to making me. up a rule. Yeah, we're, we're making up rules as we go. And I think you and I already touched on this earlier in the week when we found out the one, the only one green white checker, and it's like. They're just making up the rules again. Yep. And not even thinking about the consequences. On an an elimination race, let's make up a new rule real quick. And I don't even really mind that. You are the governing body. I mean, other professional sports have made up rules on the spot because they thought it was necessary. And and maybe it was or it wasn't. I think the NFL has done some stuff like that and that had people all up in arms for 20 minutes and then they forget. NASCAR's a little bit different uh, because there's only one event every week. It's just a one 
and everybody's watching that one event. It's not like there's 16 football games every weekend going on. Right. It kind of takes your, you know, not everybody's focused on one thing. So to make the rule up during the middle of the week, to me, looks like just making rules up. To make a rule up after the race is technically over? Yeah, <laughs> technically, yeah. What? What? Yeah. And Joey Logano's going, what do you mean that wasn't an attempt? I mashed the gas. I attempted to get <laughs> this lap in. Well, I think <laughs> Mike Helton said it all, and I think I took a video <laughs> of it, and I don't know if I ever posted it, but so we thought we had the uh, we had we thought we had the first green white checker with the second attempt. It's like, what did you just say? <laughs> yeah, he definitely said second attempt at the second attempt of the single green white of what? the of the only green white checkered. We had we had two attempts of the only one. So as we're as we are want to do and get into semantics of what he said, it's like. Dude, you just outed yourself right, right. there. Right. That you, you just made, make crap up on the made spot. It up. So I slept on this. And I woke up the next morning. And one of the first things I thought when I opened my eyes was, well, you can't pass until the start finish unless people are are slowing down or whatever. So, uh, right. in my opinion... You can't legally make a pass. Right. So there was nothing that could have happened between when that when that wreck happened, and when they threw the caution. Because they did throw the caution before they came across the start-finish. Yeah. Now, it's not written down in a rule book. It would be nice to say the leaders must start the cross-finish line, uh, must cross the start-finish line, uh, before it's counted as an attempt. Maybe that'll make the rule book next year, which nobody's allowed to see. Uh, right, but instead of wrecking down the back stretch, we're going to wreck coming to the green flag. Right. That's, which is what we did twice. Right. So... I'm I'm actually okay with the fact that we tried again under even the rule that we did because I was thinking, well, if you can't pass, then there was nothing that could have happened. There was no possibility for change in position anywhere on the track. Totally agree with you about what you just said. The semantics of what you just said, I totally agree. And I'm going to go get my on-deck beer. Oh, he's got an on-deck. What's your on-deck today? Same thing you got. Ah, the Jekyll. Very nice. You're good. <laughs> Something fell down back there, but he's uh, delicious. He's hot right. dang diggity! I love yeah. that Jekyll gets so creative with their naming. Yeah, delicious is the right word. I'm about done with mine, but I'm uh, I'm on a rant here. Let's see if anybody said something on Twitter that we should. Re- oh, <laughs> your wife is spying on us from downstairs. Oh, is she? Look at that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Serena. <laughs> so, old favorite there. <laughs> I hope that gets on the mic. It probably won't. It probably won't. She screamed something up. That was great. <laughs> um, so, I, I'm, I'm, I'm torn here. It's once again NASCAR making up a rule. It, it's not in the rule book, wherever that rule book is, and and just making up on the spot what they're going to do. However, in the end, I think it was the right call, and I'm happy we get to race again i'm happy we get to race again anyway because hey i'm not i that wasn't very satisfying as a fan let me watch that again for sure not yeah and so. nascar knew that mm-hmm. but here's the thing is and this is my concern always when nascar makes rules up is they whether they have spent hours and hours and hours and thinking about what the unintended consequences of making up a rule is they aren't they don't have the right people in the room mm-hmm. because they're for sure unprepared for normal questions and to not say things like the second attempt at a single grip. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, for sure be prepared for all of the contingencies that are going to happen, especially especially what we're going to get into here in a minute or two with what did or did what not happen next. on the second one. Yeah. So I didn't bring an on-deck beer, and I'm going to try something for the first time in podcasting history. Which is, I know my wife is listening on the on the Periscope. I Any wonder chance. if she would be willing. I, if she'd be willing to participate in the very first in a podcast Periscope deal, and let's see if this works somehow. And beg her for a visit, uh, perhaps with beer in hand. Bartender. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to sound. I, sexist I, or anything I, here. I would, I I would do this to show. I hope this is successful for you. Um, <laughs> we'll celebrate. It fun. Like it's the beginning we, of the podcast. Let's see if we get or you get lucky. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's take it to what happens next. So what does happen next? By the way, at this point, uh, uh, 
we don't have to worry about Biffle anymore. He has already went and pitted. Oh, yeah, he pitted. Uh, he pitted before the first of yep. the two attempts yep. at a single so, so now we're back to everybody's on the on the same page here. Yeah, so... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Holy crap on a pita. <laughs> oh, you brought two of them. It worked awesome. like a charm. Oh, but do you have a bottle opener? I don't have a bottle opener. Oh, uh, hold this. Okay. I'm back. Hey. <laughs> Continue. I like Surely your Surely one of these tools in here. No, don't break my stick. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the shared room. I was going to use a like craft tool. <laughs> don't break my scissors. Improvise. Oh, yeah, those are expensive those scissors. expensive stuff. By here. the way, that just worked. Holy crap. That's I can't believe That's because your wife's pretty cool. I know, I know. She knows it's not a wife get me a so beer it's thing. Not, she it brought is, me one, fun. too. I, I yeah, was so prepared, though. Got to so. finish your beer, apparently. <laughs> Don't dare me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, I'll go for that one. So, we get back. Um, it is... Uh, oh, it's there she is. Dale Jr. was raw. It sounded like you guys were. <laughs> Those shoes. Holy cow. Are they fun? Yeah. yeah. Podcast. NASCAR. NASCAR. Hey, <laughs> shoes. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. So... Let's tip this one up for yeah. Serena. Thank you. Cheers for to our part-time <laughs> producer. That totally worked. Full-time bartender. That was fantastic. Thank you, Serena. So, <laughs> here we go. We are coming back to the second attempt at the first green right checker. Right, second <laughs> what attempt. What are going to call it? Second sure. attempt of the first well, green right checker. Well, what else would you call it? I, there's no telling. Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't know. The first attempt didn't happen, so you just Yeah, they, they wrecked under caution. Uh, I bet you, uh, who was it? Jimmy and who else wrecked on that first one? It was definitely three or four Jimmy, cars. Yeah, Jimmy and somebody. Yes. Yeah. Well, I saw something funny on Twitter. It said, uh, "The gist of it was tell uh, tell all those guys that wrecked on the first non attempt that it wasn't an attempt." Right. Right. They wrecked under you high wrecked speed for no reason. Why did you wreck? They wrecked under high speed caution. Right. High <laughs> speed caution. Yeah. <laughs> so we get <laughs> now. Here's the biggest controversy. <laughs> <laughs> so we get to the second green white check. Now, well, first, up to this let's point, talk about what we're, yep. what we're at. Yep. So, at some point between the last few laps of the race, the first attempt, uh, Harvick's torn his motor up. Or yeah, he's torn his drivetrain up. He's torn something up, and he can't go. He can't go. He's in first gear, under caution, going, I don't think I can go any faster than this right here. Right. So, we get to the restart box. I think they make it maybe 100. So let's start on what Harvick did in the first one. He already knew he had a problem. Yep. In the first one, as soon as the pack started to go, he immediately jumps out of line. Yep. And lets people go underneath him. And he's top, right? He was on the top. He was on the top. Not a problem. Uh, Just so happens when they wave the caution, he's still in an even position. So he's, again, on on the the top top again. Yep. So we take off again. This time, he doesn't get out of the way. And right before then, there was some... Suspect chatter on the radio, which was like, "Boy, it sure would be nice if a caution came out after they got to the start finish." Because his getting to the next round depends on him not getting it was contingent upon him being on the lead lap, right? Basically, which, yeah, he would have been on the lead lap, but I mean, he had to, he had to finish. He wouldn't have finished in the top thirty, you know. And well, he, well he if, he, if he could only top. go 45, 50, 60 miles an hour, and they ran two laps oh, yeah, at two hundred, he's going thinking, to get laps. I was thinking one for lap sure. for some stupid reason. Yeah, this is green but white I mean, checkered. Not I'm getting in semantics with you <laughs> now. Checkered. But no, 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 you're right. You're right. It's he two needed laps, yeah. that thing not to be green for very long. Right. And what happened? And it was not green for very long. He so instead of like the first restart, first attempt at the green white checkered, uh, where he just moved up, he stayed where he was, which left a lane up top. Right. Trevor Bain, who... Was it Trevor Bain? It was. Uh, who we've talked about on this podcast a couple times now, so props to Trevor for getting, I guess, good and bad here. Yeah. Trevor Bain takes a top line because Harvick's still going caution speed at this point. You can see on the Correct. replay where... And let's not forget, they made it much further into the restart attempt on the second time. A couple hundred Probably yards. a couple hundred yards, yep. which... At 70 miles an hour is still two or three seconds. Yeah, yeah. So, Trevor Bain takes a top because Kevin Harvick isn't moving anywhere, and he's right in the middle, So, and there's a lane up there. So, that's the only lane he can take. I'm taking the top. What you see on the replay, first off, Harvick's spotter's got to be telling him in and out, in and out, in and out, or something. For sure. That there's a guy inside, and now there's a guy outside. And 
Harvick is looking in his mirror and over his shoulder, right? I'm talking about looking up and over. Yes. He has to see Trevor Bay. Has to see Trevor Bay. Yes. And what does he do? Turns right into him. Turns right into him. And not, him. not just, here's how you know, here's like, you don't know, we don't know, it's all speculation. Okay, Delana Harvick made a big deal on the internet, blah, 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 blah. We all know what happened. If you know racing, you know what happened. He waited all the way until Bain was passed. So I, don't give me any of this, oh, well, you can't see over your right shoulder very well in a stock car. Yeah, but if he's in front of you, you can. <laughs> and that's and what I was that's about to say. that's when he chose to turn right. He didn't turn into his nose. He turned, he turned into, into his, his rear quarter left panel. quarter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he turned into left rear quarter panel, and it's like, dude, on the last one, you were over 500 yards before you got to this one, mm-hmm. and now you're going to dump somebody? Yeah. I mean, I understand the strategy, but own it. Yeah. For sure, own it. Well, here's the thing. If you own it, then it might get taken away. It's subject for you to be put a lap down. So this is where, once again, Rusty slept on this one. And I said, first off, if you put yourself in Kevin, Kevin Harvick's shoes, you have to do this. I'm sorry, Trevor Bain. I'm sorry, Dale Earnhardt Jr. I'm sorry, everybody else. I'm thinking about me right now. Junior, for sure. I've got to get... I, I can't get lapped right here. I have to make something happen. I have to make a caution happen because my thing's not going to go. People were talking about, why didn't they black flag him? Well, he was under caution. He was running speed, uh, running the caution speed. You so. only have to maintain caution pace right. to start a race. Right. So there was no For those who didn't to. know that, that's the rule. Right. If you can maintain caution speed, you can restart the race. So. Which is maybe something NASCAR should visit. Maybe. It's tough to say, though. Yeah, how do you make those judgment calls? I'm not, I'm not upset about that. Right. I'm upset at the situation, but I don't think I'm upset at anybody in particular. Kevin Harvick is looking I'm after upset Kevin at NASCAR. Harvick. Imagine if I'm Kevin Harvick and I'm like, the only way for me to win a championship this year is for me to cause a caution to happen. I'm just going to do it, and I'll deal with the consequences later. So then you do it, right? Yep. Then the race ends. We'll talk about what happened at the finish of the race there. But the race ends, and uh, lo and behold... Uh, he he does a, or it, it ends because they're past the start finish line according to the new rule that NASCAR just made up, and uh, he's in to the next round because he didn't get lapped, and now you now second to this now second to having done it, I think you have to not deny it up and down. You have to say I did not do that on purpose. There's nothing about I I got messed up. Whatever whatever excuses you have to make because NASCAR has shown that they're going to change the rules. And they may kick you out of the out of the uh, chase. That's true. So and, and they they've messed with chase contenders before the Clint Boyer deal with uh, Truex. Uh, Truex got uh, Gordon Gordon in, back Truex in. out. You're like half a name ahead of me on every one of these. Which Sorry. Is funny. No, no, no. It's good. I'm glad. <laughs> it yeah. Causes me less pause. But uh, but uh, we know that NASCAR has done that before. So we may do it again. So now you have to deny up and down. It makes him look like a goober. Which sucks for him, but at the end of the day, if he takes home the trophy, uh, I don't know if there's an asterisk associated with it. But uh, in the fans' eyes, there may be. But he he'll go down in the history books with that. I cannot blame Kevin Harvick for what happened, even if he did it on purpose. I I don't blame Kevin Harvick for doing it on purpose because NASCAR put the walls around the sandbox, mm-hmm. put the toys in the sandbox. And said, these are the toys and the sand that you had to play with. And what they figured out... What he figured out, if you rip the head off the Barbie doll and put it on the G.I. Joe, you get something better. And so, uh, that's what he did. He, right. He and use messed whatever, with it. Yeah, use yeah. whatever sandbox analogy you want. Their team figured out how to how to get to the next round. Yep. Hard to be upset about that. It's kind of like Newman at Phoenix. Eight tires are better than four. He door slams Kyle Larson because he got to have the position to, mm-hmm. to, to to race with a cup at that point. Yeah, it's the last elimination. Yeah, we're in and line. you know it's like okay, so I'm not mad at Kevin Harvick. Uh, I understand now, especially through your explanation of what needs to happen psychologically, you can't admit that that's what you did. Mm-hmm. But because everybody on that racetrack knows what he did, how are you not wrecking him at Martinsville if you're Trevor? <laughs> Well, as soon as I fall a lap down and I'm Trevor Bain, boom. There is no... And I mean race over wrecked. I yeah. mean, into the corner at 140 mile an hour, 
you're going into the wall. Well, that's the consequences. That's the have at it, boys. But, and that, but that's, see, that's why Brian Zane France said didn't have a problem with what Harvick did, regardless, basically, is what he said. Mm-hmm. Because he wants Trevor Bain to dump him at Martinsville. Well, so put yourself in Trevor Bain's shoes. There is no Trevor Bain nation, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and there is Kevin Harvick nation or whatever you want to call it. There's, there's a lot of Kevin Harvick fans. And I, I think it's in bad taste for him to do that here. I would say wait until Daytona. Take out his chance at a Daytona 500, if you can, if Trevor Bain's even racing a car next year at the 500. That's an interesting point. I, Guys I don't typically think... don't issue punishment at play tracks, though. Good point. Because yeah. of the collateral damage perspective. <laughs> collateral damage is right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe you do it at Atlanta. Uh, maybe, uh, I, I don't know where you, where you uh, dole out your punishment, but... I think it would be hard for me to do that, uh, or I think it's hard for Trevor Bain to do that to a championship contender at this point. Or maybe you do. So, maybe you I, do I, it, Martinsville. I Hill. totally agree with you on all accounts. I think if you're Trevor Bain, if you're me, you have to shrug this off. He did not cost you a win, and you're right. not having a good season. It doesn't right. do you any favors to wreck. Right. Your whole team is down. Maybe you just chalk this one up to bad luck. Or... or Maybe you do you get him. Turn vigilante. Maybe you do get him at Martinsville and just take away one of his chances. He's still got two more chances. Well, wow, there's that. And you you take him out. I'm, I know I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, no, but no, I'm exploring that's, that's the That's the whole point yeah. of radio. That's yeah. the whole point I'm of talk the radio. Subject. Maybe you do take him out at Martinsville and say everybody else had three chances. You only got two because you messed me up. You can get it all, bro. Oh, super! Casey hit the wall at Martinsville. <laughs> Duh. Backup car. Um. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get some of that later. I know who I'm not <laughs> picking for Martin's <laughs> crap. He's good there too. Just nah. Anyway, the thing is with with the payback thing is there's two ways to do it. You can get it all back in one, and you and you have to have this. You know, there's a psychology component of do I do it now? Do I wait till next year? Do I do what, mm-hmm. big track, little track, whatever track? Or or you can do what I've seen other drivers do, and I wish I could think in my head about who it is. I, Newman feels like one of these types where every race next year, you just do a little something <laughs> to F with it. You know, like yeah. maybe you pick the pit stop in front of him just so you can try to booger up one of his pit stops. Yeah, yeah. Stuff like that. <laughs> Just, okay. just never let the guy in line, and just you know what I mean. Like, yeah. you just meet yeah. out that punishment over the course of right. the entire right. year. Make him take half a lap more to pass you if you're going down. A exactly. Lap. Yeah. Bristol, make him take 15 laps <laughs> to get by you because you can do that at Bristol. Yeah. You know that kind of stuff. That I, and that's I the like kind of it. stuff you can do. I like it. That's I mean that's psychological. That's the kind of that's stuff our guy does. Chinese water torture stuff. That's the kind yes. of stuff our guy does. Yes, true. He will not straight up wreck somebody, but he will. Yeah, he will mess with you <laughs> at any given opportunity. So let's move on. I think we've we've done everything we can do uh, we can do on that. I, I again, I'm okay with everything that happened except for NASCAR. <laughs> you know, so that's it. Uh, so oh, that was I, in qualifying. Oh, super! So Joey, last place is on the pole, by the way. Oh, last <laughs> place! Wow, no kidding. I wish we had got to watch that qualifying, but we just got too many things going on. Something I did post on Twitter. Uh, fans were booing at the end of it, and they were throwing beers, which I don't. I saw like. that. I don't like throwing beers. I don't. The possibility that the driver could have his window net down and somehow get injured is is like it's to me. It's not. Yeah, that and, can't happen. And I and I, the fans are mad at NASCAR. They're not mad at Joey Logano. Right, uh, what did Joey that Logano beer up do? into the box? Yeah, what did Joey Logano do? Oh, by the way, end of the race. We didn't talk about this part. End of the race, I picked uh, Junior. And when the caution came on on the NBC... Uh, he was ahead. Uh, yeah, deal. He was ahead. And I'm just <laughs> celebrating. I'm marching back celebrate, and forth. Oh, yeah. Celebrate. Dance to the music. <laughs> oh, I was dancing to the music, man. Uh, and the fat lady had sang and everything. And I'm dancing to her music. And sure enough, of course, I go back to the replay. And Joey Logano was ahead when the official caution came out. You may want to adjust that phone because so, you've been off every much oh, since I've, I've you been leaning back. Oh, I've been just leaning back as yeah. I'm getting excited. So, um, so I tweeted out, the fans are booing. I said, good for them. They deserve better. Yeah. They do. Yeah. That's, and that's why we're here talking about it. Yeah. It's like, in the end, we don't have to get emotionally attached to whether you're upset at Harvick or some other driver. The bottom line is, NASCAR created this thing that happened. The drivers only ever do what 
they're allowed to do within the bubble that is mm-hmm. NASCAR. If you, I mean, if they, they figure something out and they change the impact of race on their behalf, I, I mean, NASCAR's all but said that's what they want to happen. Mm-hmm. They want to, they want it in the driver's hands. Well, it was in Kevin Harvick's hands. Mm-hmm. He made something happen. Yep. How are you going to be mad at him? Yep. So, let's close it out there with for Talladega. Let's open it up for Martinsville. Mm. We're going to Martinsville. One of our favorite racetracks. One of our favorite tracks. We've been there. We've been there. We it did. Was we went a few years ago awesome. to the uh, spring race. It was a great tailgate. What a neat place. A great, yeah, the whole thing was really cool. Yeah. So, it takes us there. Um, I don't know what else to say other than picking folks. Because <laughs> what is there to say at this point? There wasn't any new... Rules this week. Harvick is not going to get punished. He was officially absolved of any officially responsibility. Exonerated, right? So, um, so yeah. I, and I think we did talk about it. When does Trevor Bain pay back? What, you know, what is the next deal there? So let's uh, let's start picking people. And you know what happens when we pick people? Yeah, oh yeah. There it is. So it needs yeah. to be a high quality. Oh, it's one of the top sound bites. The fact that you recorded it is still that's that's great. So let's see. I guess I technically finished highest uh, because Junior won second place. <laughs> so oh yeah yeah. So I got to pick first, um, and I had my pick ready, and then I forgot who it was. <laughs> so. Because we've been talking about so many different drivers. Who in the world did I pick? I didn't even write it down, did I? No, I'm an idiot. So, um, off the cuff. So, I'm going to pick somebody in the chase. I'm going to say this. I think only chase drivers win the rest of the races, by the way. Because after Talladega's over now, which is kind of a crapshoot, I th- I think only chase drivers are going to win. We're going to get into this in later podcasts. Yeah, well, but the only some... one in recent memory that's won since Talladega who wasn't chasing... Was none other than Casey Kane. Yeah. At Phoenix. Yep. And the Red Bull number some four car. Couches flipped over on that one. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm totally with you. Um, I think at this point, whether you want to get into conspiracy mode about whether NASCAR lets them have a little bit more motor or whatever, you can, <laughs> you can play those games if those are fun to you. But I think the reality is that the way this works, the way this sport works is that the cream rises to the top always. And the people that are in it to win it step their game up. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like not all eight guys uh, have a chance to win, but only three of them only three of them can win. Yeah. Yeah. So my my pick, who I just remembered, was Jeff Gordon. Oh, you stole my pick. Oh, man. Sure. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> so another grandfather clock for Jeff Gordon. Uh, he has... Many is the answer to that. You know question. what's ironic about Jeff's chase so far is he's he. Somebody has I saw described it as very Newman like, <laughs> in that he's not you not see his car very much, but he's steady, slow and steady wins the race. Yeah, that was my pick um, for a couple reasons. Uh, one, uh, Jeff's kind of good there. Yes, <laughs> and two, he's got a room where he keeps his clocks. Two is in the modern era. And let's say in our lifetime, Hendrick has by far been the best race team at mm-hmm. Martinsville. Um, so, and I because I think you're right that a chase driver is going to win, I'm going to go way off the map a little bit. At least I think it's off the map a little bit. I'm going to go Martin Truex Jr. Truex, okay. Another yeah. one who is sort of limping around. And I believe he's the one that has been accused of not even having a top 10, but is still survived. Wow. In the last segment. Wow. So, very interesting. Yeah. Well, what that means is that he hasn't had a bottom 10 either. Right. So, right. you know, that's that's the consistency that me and you like versus the winning portion of One of, of us should have like, picked uh, Joey Logano because he's going to win. Well, yeah. <laughs> 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 I did I did pick Jeff Gordon when I was doing my Or my Brad. Notes. Brad could win it. Uh, but I'm going with Martin Truex because I think that's more fun. Yeah. I, it's half sentimental, half this is my best chance to pick Jeff Gordon. <laughs> right. So, well, I, I, hope think, the, I hope the cards play out right now and get to pick him at, uh, 
at Phoenix. Okay. I'll, uh, I'm not I'll saying lay off. I'm just saying <laughs> hopefully I'll win at Texas and then I can... <laughs> you can take that one, yeah. I can take it. <laughs> so let's talk for a second about Halloween. Let's close this thing out. Mm. Halloween. Heck yeah. Did you see what Tony Stewart uh Oh my goodness. I think I clued you into something you did. that was going you did. on. I, uh, Tony, Tony for a couple hours broke. Uh, if NASCAR had its own version of Twitter and everybody that likes NASCAR and follows NASCAR, that's the only people that were on it, he would have broken it. Right. Um, what do you call that? What's that costume? It's like a it's like Chiquita the Hawaiian, Banana. Oh, woman, the, yeah, yeah, Chiquita Banana. Or, yeah. Basically, he was in like Gypsy a costume. bra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a frilly pink bra with a goofy hat. And like silk pants. Yeah, and oh, uh, his makeup was out the he wazoo. Had makeup, he had on earrings, uh, and it was the whole a deal. Big old hairy beer belly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I as a big old hairy beer belly guy, I loved that, that was costume. a good costume. And people were uh, people were acting like they were grossed out, but I'm telling you, I looked at it a million times, and every time I saw it, I was laughing. Costume of the year, Tony Stewart. I'm glad we got to this because this brings up a social, a NASCAR social subject that I'd like to not necessarily close with, but but definitely <laughs> to get in. Who was he with in this picture? Uh, that was it. Was that his crew chief that was in the picture? Not his that? crew chief. That's Kurt's crew chief. Okay, Kurt's crew chief, uh, who had a middle finger, uh, was wearing a middle <laughs> finger. It's Tony Old Man Gibson. Uh, is wearing a felt costume that. His head is right in the middle of the middle finger. <laughs> and Gluck had a very interesting social I comment. I did see this. So about go this. ahead. Yeah. So because NASCAR.com and NASCAR the entity wanted to capitalize on the attention that Tony was getting, yep. as they are want to do. <laughs> That's the word of the day, folks. It is. This is Pee Wee's Playhouse. Write it down. <laughs> ah! <laughs> uh, Hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Gluck's commentary was. NASCAR has posted a picture of a guy wearing a middle finger costume. They can never again penalize someone for using the middle finger on the racetrack. Absolutely true. Totally 100%. true. 100%. Yep. Totally true. Yep. And they can't punish me for giving middle fingers out to no. people that I don't like. No. Okay. Uh, we talked about it. BYOP today. Uh, we've got tomorrow, Saints and Sinners Ball. Me and you are going to like Heck a yeah. trendy concert Yeah, we're thing. going to a hipster kind of a deal. <laughs> I guess that's what I'd call it. Uh, a little modern day music, ex ambassadors. Ambassadors. Yep. It's gonna Still be fun. Learning. I like the music, just don't know it that well. Um, I got a great costume worked up. I, I don't keep secrets very well, so Rusty already knows what I'm dressing up as. He doesn't know, or I don't know what he's dressing up. Oh, it's as, a whoopee but, cushion. Oh, heck yeah! <laughs> so for those that are followers of the uh, the trilogy, The Hangover, I'm dressing up as Alan. The uh, it's perfect. The weird brother. <laughs> Of the bride uh, from the first movie. He was in all three, of course, but I'm wearing his outfit from the first movie. Uh, so that'll be fun. I'm sure that stuff will wind up on Twitter. Uh, so you'll get to see Rusty and me and uh, his wife, Serena, and then our friend, uh, Courtney, who I believe is going to be wearing a Heidi, sexy Heidi outfit. Excellent. Or a beer. German beer wench. I think Serena's outfit. doing a, uh, a witch, and it's actually really good. She did it. She made the dress and everything herself. It's amazing. Nice. That's cool. So it's Our, a whole different uh, thing. We had so we got to get into some personal stuff that none of y'all will care about. We <laughs> went to an event last Saturday night um, that is by far the wildest, most exciting, crazy, uh, inspirational. How many words can we use to describe event? Sporting event. Yeah, I mean, we were excited last year when Casey Kane hit the walk off at Atlanta to make the chase. What we saw Saturday night in Bobby Dodd Stadium, I believe, eclipses that by two or three times. I got to tell you, I the excitement with Casey running around and us holding on and going, "Come on, come on!" Well, that's was true. There was that was that, a different thing. I just got goosebumps. I like, did too. Uh, that was an amazing experience. This one was. We had Georgia Tech no, and Florida Stages who we're talking about. You said it best, and I'll quote you. We Okay. So, Rusty immediately put on Facebook, like, the quote of the day, and the, and the, <laughs> the just an accurate, to completely accurate description of the day. 59 minutes and 54 seconds of uh, 
realistic expectations followed by six seconds of the most joyous yeah i think i said of glory glory that <laughs> yeah. you could like ever experience yeah uh, something only a stick and ball sport could really do because like said for casey we kind of had a come like, on come like on, you didn't Jesus. see this coming yeah. in a football game but you no. could maybe see it coming in a race so everybody owes it to themselves unless you're a florida state fan which i you know I'm not, here, I'm not here to crap on anybody I'm I'm rooting for you when you're when you're uh, representing the ACC in the playoffs and all that, but man, uh, you owe it to yourself to go listen to our local guy, uh, Brandon Gordon. Uh, did I pronounce that right? Yeah, Gordon. Um, excuse me. He's uh, he's calling the game and he just goes nuts and his color guy goes nuts. And yeah, the color guy is is, is uh, Bedford, who was the center at Georgia Tech. When Paul Johnson first got there, aerospace engineer, pretty smart dude. Oh, uh, that's sweet. And he got to take over Roddy. They're job. going nuts. The engineers are going nuts. Everybody's, Everybody's going, going nuts. It was awesome. Bananas. It was awesome. So, uh, you owe it to yourself to go look at that. You can find it. Just search Georgia Tech or just go to ESPN.com homepage. Right. It was the number one play of the week. It's not likely to be eclipsed as the number one play of the year. Right. And meanwhile, never mind the fact that Georgia Tech was two and five coming in. Florida State was ranked number nine and undefeated. So, it was, like you said, nearly an hour of realistic or hours worth of football of realistic expectations, followed by the most exciting moment I've ever seen at a sport event. It was awesome. You ready to close it out? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So, once again, it's the PETM podcast, guys, for another week, the Talladega episode, and uh, I'm Rusty at Tailgate Mayor. And uh, we've got, uh, follow us on Twitter at, at PETM Podcast. And we got that uh, we got that email. Hit us up on that G-chat. <laughs> yeah, we hit us up on the Gmail, y'all. It's PETM Podcast at gmail.com. All over case, though case doesn't matter for Gmail. My personal Twitter handle is P-R-E-G-A-M-E-N-G, pregame E-N-G. And thumbs up, y'all. Talk to you next week.